Hello everyone, I'm Salim Kikeke. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. As the World Health Organization says, the coronavirus outbreak is getting bigger. The first case in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are here today to announce the presence of the first case of uh, coronavirus disease in Niger confirmed in Nigeria. We'll be speaking to Nigeria's health minister. What do we know about the patient and how prepared is the country? It led to thousands fleeing their homes in the DR Congo's Ituri province, now a rebel group, and the government sign a peace deal. Guinea prepares for Sunday's referendum on a new constitution. Opposition groups claim it will allow President Conde to stay in power. Also in the program, jazzing up classical music. The Kenyan musician giving these children a chance to learn an instrument. And in sports, it's the quarterfinals of the African Champions League with two games taking place today. Thanks for join, joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Nigeria has confirmed the country's first case of coronavirus, the first in sub-Saharan Africa. The man, an Italian, was not detected when he arrived at Lagos Airport and he travelled through the city before he became ill. The health minister told the BBC the government has been preparing for this eventuality. The World Health Organization has upgraded the global risk from high to very high. We begin our coverage in Lagos and this report from Yemisi Adegoke. It's the first positive case of coronavirus in sub-Saharan Africa. Nigeria's health minister confirmed the case in the country's capital. We are here today to announce the presence of the first case of uh, coronavirus disease in Niger confirmed in Nigeria. The patient who came from Milan was screened at the international airport in Lagos, but authorities say the virus wasn't detected because of the delay in symptoms. He transited through Istanbul on Turkish Airlines and arrived in Lagos on Monday night at 9 p.m. He spent the night in a hotel near the airport and on Tuesday morning he moved on to his business in Bogon State where he's engaged by a corporate entity. The patient is now being treated at an infectious disease hospital in Yaba. The patient is doing quite well. Uh, he's, a, he's a young man, 44 years old. Uh, all these uh, vital signs are stable. He's, he's actually doing very well. The case has sparked concern over Nigeria's screening capabilities and its ability to cope with an outbreak. Officials say they have started reviewing the flight carrying the coronavirus patient and tracking those who may have been in contact with him. They have also sent more than 60 doctors to boost screening efforts at the airport. The World Health Organization had already expressed its concerns over Africa's readiness to deal with the potential outbreak. Nigeria, Africa's most popular country, had already been identified as one of the top priority countries and was receiving more support from the agency. Authorities say that they are ready to fight any potential outbreak. So what else do we know about Nigeria's preparedness? Is It has four labs for testing. 60 doctors are help, helping with screening at airports. We heard from the health minister Osagi Ehanire in the report there confirming the first case in Nigeria. He's been speaking to BBC's Doshima Abu in Abuja. So how prepared is the country? Nigeria regards repetitive uh, points of entry as being airports and we are watching our international airports very closely. Portal services are retrained and retrained, and their skills and knowledge is being constantly expanded. We have a passive thermal scanners that scan every passenger entering the country. Every passenger fills a form to advise about the countries they've been in within the last 21 days, and uh, uh, if any of them is suspicious uh, for um, coronavirus burden, we invite them for an interview, obtain their history and uh, everyone gets a form where they give the, uh, their own telephone number and we give them a number to call in case they feel unwell. This they must do in their own interest and the interest of their own families and community. So that what is going on, 
with portal services are the first line of defense. The second line of defense is Nigeria Center for Disease Control, uh, which has beefed up um, equipment and materials. We have uh, the capacity to diagnose the coronavirus in four Nigerian laboratories now. We have uh, quite a lot of primers on ground and uh, we have uh, acquired a lot of personal protective equipment and uh, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control has distributed these ones in strategic areas and is uh, making good stockpiles. The government has released funds for procurement and we are constantly daily improving our readiness. Nigerians are also worried that why are we not stopping international flight coming in, flight from these affected countries? Are you considering that also? No, in the first place, we do not have a direct flight coming in from China, which is still the epicenter for the coronavirus. Uh, I, we are, we, again, we are following the guidelines of the WHO and they have not recommended that restriction. Uh, many airlines have voluntarily restricted their own flight movements, uh, either for economic reasons or for reasons of their own safety. But we are not prohibiting any uh, flights. And since we have just one case and we are very vigilant on the borders, we are still uh, playing by ear, looking at uh, how the situation develops. Do you say that uh, if this comes to Africa, that um, the health structure for Africa may not be able to contain this? It could spread faster in Africa because of our health structure, the lack of very viable health infrastructure. Africa will do its very best. Uh, we had a meeting of African uh, ministers of health in Addis Ababa uh, on Saturday, that's a few days ago, or six days ago now, and uh, that meeting we discussed our strengths and weaknesses and resolved to col collaborate and cooperate in uh, dealing with uh, any uh, uh, possible case of uh, coronavirus uh, entry into the continent. So we do have preparatory uh, measures outlined and uh, also a plan to support each other in case there's an outbreak anywhere. Nigeria's health minister there. Now, as the coronavirus spreads, what's the impact across Africa and the globe? Here's Focus on Africa's Daniel Henry. Done. Thanks, Salim. Well, the picture across Africa and the rest of the world is changing all the time, but these are some of the main developments today. The WHO has been warning that most, if not all, countries should expect outbreaks, and the epidemic has sparked fears of a global recession. More than $5 trillion have been wiped off the share values this week. As Wall Street opened, stocks fell sharply for a fifth successive day, with the Dow Jones index falling by almost 3%. Markets in Europe and Asia were down too. It's on course to be the worst week since the financial crisis of 2008. On the continent, South Africa has ordered the evacuation of all its nationals living in Wuhan. That's the, city, that's the city at the epicenter of the outbreak in China, after numerous requests from the families. President Cyril Ramaphosa said that nearly 200 South Africans are in the city and 132 of them want to return home. The government says that, need, that none of them have tested positive for the coronavirus. But two South Africans working aboard a cruise ship on the Princess Diamond, that's the one that's, that's been quarantined for three weeks in Japan, well, they have tested positive. They're the first South Africans to confirm with the virus and they're being treated in Japan. Flights from China to Kenya, well, they've been, they've been temporarily suspended by Kenya's High Court in response to the outbreak. There are no confirmed cases in Kenya just yet. Globally, more than 80,000 people in nearly 50 countries have been infected. And the biggest national outbreak outside China is in South Korea, where 315 cases have now been reported. More than 2,000 cases in total have now come to light. There is slightly better news in China, though. 329 cases discovered. That's the lowest daily increase in figures for a month. And, China, and, and Japan sorry, now says that 914 people in the country have the virus. In the last half an hour, we found out that, that the number of confirmed cases in Italy has jumped from 650 to 821. Many thanks, Dan. And you can keep up to date with all the latest developments on the coronavirus outbreak by visiting our website. There's a live page with all the latest developments plus analysis from our correspondents. Simply go to bbc.com forward slash news or download the BBC News app onto your smartphone or tablet device. Now, the government of the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo has signed a peace deal with the leaders of the armed militia group, the Patriotic Resistance Front. The group's been active in the northeast region of Ituri for nearly 20 years, and it was a key player in the conflict that left 
tens of thousands dead from Kinshasa. Here's Gaius Kovene. The peace deal was signed in the northeastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ituri province, in one of the strongholds of the rebels from the Patriotic Resistance Front in Ituri, which or FRPI. And this is one of the main groups, one of the key players of the conflict that killed nearly 50,000 people between 1999 and 2003, according to the United Nations. Now that they have accepted to lay down guns and surrender during a peace process, it brings a spark of hope for locals, especially those who suffered mainly displacement due to several attacks by members of this militia. During the speech, the militia leader say that he hopes that all parties, which means the Congolese government and the rebels, they will respect their commitment and that their demands that have been accepted by the government will be granted on time. However, this is not the end of everything. After this, the two parties will continue discussions on practical measures, practical ways to implement and make sure this peace deal is enforced. On the other side, the Congolese government representatives who were at the ceremony, they called on other armed groups to follow this path and lay down their guns, also to join the peace process for the pacification of the country. From Kinshasa, I'm Gaius Kowene for BBC News. Now the people of Giri go to the polls on Sunday for parliamentary elections and also a referendum on a controversial constitutional change brought forward by President Alpha Conde. The government says the referendum is about updating the constitution, but the president's opponents, a coalition of civil society groups and political parties say it will allow Mr. Conde to seek a third term in office. The BBC's Olivia Weber reports. Frustration on the streets of Conakry. Months of violence have preceded this weekend's vote on changes to the constitution. Over 30 people have been killed so far. If passed, the current president, Alpha Condé, could be allowed to run again beyond the current constitution's two-term limit. The 81-year-old president was the first democratically elected leader in the country's history. His second and final term expires this October. He was initially hailed by the international community as a model of leadership in Africa. However, many worry that the result will only lead to more unrest. Now, an opposition coalition known as the FNDC has declared that it no longer recognizes Conde as president, vowing to disrupt Sunday's polls. The FNDC is ready to do whatever it takes to prevent a referendum from taking place. The FNDC is engaged, and I remind you that we are in a phase of resistance. A Paris-based group of French-speaking countries, OIF, was due to monitor this weekend's vote, but has pulled out after calling into question problematic entries on the electoral register. President Condé has been quoted as saying that the 2010 constitution was bad and needed modernizing. The draft includes several progressive provisions, especially for women. It would outlaw female circumcision, as well as underaged and forced marriages. In preparation for the vote, the government has announced that it is deploying the army right across the country on election day to secure the process. In Guinea-Bissau, Umaru Sissoko Mbalo swore himself in as president and promised dignity, peace and progress. Mbalo took the oath of, the, of office in the capital despite a legal challenge to his election. The poll loser challenged the poll outcome in January. On Thursday, the cabinet issued a statement warning that Mbalo could not be sworn in until the Supreme Court issued a ruling on the dispute. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Salim Kikeke. Still to come, we speak to Liverpool's Sergio Mane about what winning the English Premier League would mean back home in Senegal. Welcome back. I'm Salim Kikeke. The top stories this hour. The first confirmed case of the coronavirus in sub-Saharan Africa has been reported in Nigeria. The World Health Organization upgrades the global risk to very high as dozens of countries struggle to contain outbreaks. 
Now, every two years, scientists, researchers, and mathematicians from across Africa get together for the next Einstein Forum, uh, the next Einstein Forum, to find, presumably, the next Einstein. This year, it's taking place in Nairobi, and the theme is innovation. The BBC's Nicola Nikose uh, asked Thierry Zomahun, the president of the forum, about the impact of science on development in Africa. You cannot transform a nation without science and technology. The impact, you can see it. You know M-Pesa. M-Pesa has had a huge impact on Africa's transformation on mobile banking, mobile money. You are very optimistic about uh, science, but I'm not sure that the African governments are aware of the importance of science for the development of the continent. Uh, 20 years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about mathematical sciences for development, for Africa's No one would have cared. Uh, absolutely. But there's a paradigm shift. When you look at uh, what is going on, over the past 30 years, Africa spent uh, annually four billion US dollars to pay professionals of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, expatriate. That is 120 billion US dollars that Africa has been paying into importing STEM professionals. Imagine if we take half of that investment, what we could have achieved in terms of building engineering schools. Africa is the future of science globally. Some of the grand challenges that the world is facing today, the crisis of biodiversity, climate change, infectious diseases, Africa will provide solution not only to Africa's grand challenges, but to the global challenge. You are organizing the third edition of the next Einstein Forum in uh, Nairobi between the 10th and the 13th of March. Um, do you mean that the next Einstein might be African? Yeah, uh, no doubt about that. It's not a matter of might be or maybe, there's no doubt. Mathematically, the probability of the next Einstein to come from a continent which will house 40% uh, of the, global, the world's youth it's clear to me where we want young people who are inventing innovators to display uh, and share with the whole world what they're doing. But the other thing that you're going to be saying is uh, what we name, we coin as the Kifra Prize. The Kifra Prize is what some are calling the African Nobel Prize. We want to reward young Africans, scientists, who are doing breakthrough research. That's uh, Thierry Zabahun, the president of the next Einstein Forum, speaking to Nicola Nicose. Well, it's now time for some sport, and Mimi is here. Mimi. Definitely not an Einstein, but hey, that's okay. It's the first leg of the African Champions League quarterfinals. Two matches today. First game kicked off in Cairo between Egypt's Zamalek and Holders Esperance of Tunisia. And it's coming to stoppage time. Zamalek leading 2-1 at the moment. A little later, Morocco's Raja Casablanca faced visitors TP Mazembe of DR Congo. Raja coach Jamal Salami talks about the challenge ahead. We will meet one of the most famous teams in this Champions League, a team that has experience and strength. We know that TB Mazembe is strong at home, but when they move it to North Africa, they have a lot of concern. It's up to us to be on time tomorrow, to be efficient tomorrow in front of our supporters. This match is special for us, especially as we know very well that the supporters want to win the Champions League. I hope all the players will be ready for tomorrow's match to win and satisfy our fans. Let's move on to here to the UK and to the English Premier League. Many Nigerian football fans were celebrating on Thursday. That's because this man... Ojon Igalo became the first Nigerian to score for Manchester United in their 5-0 win over Belgium's Club Bruges in the Europa League. They will now face Austrian side Lask in the last 16. But for many football fans in Lagos, Igalo's goal was widely celebrated. Actually, we Nigerian here, as Nigerian, as a, and one of his fans as I'm talking to you right now, we are expecting more from him and which he has been doing. He's a promising guy anyway. So we, we would love to hear more from him. And we are very, as you can see, I, I, I heard, I was so happy this morning when I heard about it because the jubilation is everywhere on the radio. We have our own first Nigerian in Manchester United and scoring the goal in his first start. So it's something we should be proud of. Yeah. Money for life, Igalu, keep on scoring. Igalu, I love you. 
They certainly do love him. Still in the Premier League. What a season the Senegal star Sadio Mane is having. He's part of a Liverpool team who can move within three victories of the Premier League title on Saturday if they can win away to Watford. And once this campaign is over, Mane can't wait to get back to Senegal. Wow, it will be incredible, honestly. It will be so, so incredible because in Senegal now, everybody become a Liverpool fan. Two or three years ago was not the case. They have more than United. They have more United fans in Barcelona and Madrid. But now it's Liverpool. Everywhere you go, you have Liverpool so to by wearing to people. So which is, if Liverpool is playing right now, it's like a national team is playing. So just incredible, especially winning this trophy and go back home. I think it will be massive for 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 myself. Definitely big celebrations in Senegal and South Africa's cricketers produced a record-breaking victory earlier today at the Women's T20 World Cup in Australia. They made 195 for three, the biggest score in their tournament's history with Lizelle Lee hitting 101 as they thrashed Thailand by 113 runs to stay on course for a semi-final place. That's all the sports, Salim. Many thanks, Mimi. Now, a classical and jazz musician from Kenya has resorted to an unusual method to encourage would-be musicians. In Kenya, musical instruments can be very expensive, and that puts off many students and their families. So Dan Abisi has taken things into his own hands and has started a business making the instruments. My name is Dan Abisi. I have been a music educator for a very long time. And uh, we realized that there's a need in uh, schools for quality music training that is uh, affordable. I got the interest to, uh, to assemble instruments when I was in school. I took some few courses online and got to see what people are doing. From there I teamed up with people who've been around and uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, professional instrument uh, uh, assembly and uh, we got started on that. We source for our parts and designs from all over the world and uh, assemble our instruments here locally so that they can be used for the local market. It's getting high quality brass so now we, our work is now to put it together and then uh, it's, uh, it's, it's now ready to be used. It's treated and then ready to be used. The benefits of assembling these instruments from Kenya is it's cheaper. A lot of established brands have a very high price margin that uh, make these instruments unavailable. I have a very uh, fond affection towards playing brass instruments because uh, as uh, solo instruments you're able to play uh, alone but also just as solo instruments uh, you're able to play as a team. Uh, if we play in a team it sounds even better and we play better. Now, before we go, a look again at our top story. Nigeria has confirmed the country's first case of the coronavirus, the first in sub-Saharan Africa. The man, in, an Italian, landed in Lagos and traveled through the city before he became ill. Speaking to the BBC, Nigeria's health minister said the infected passenger was not detected when he arrived at the airport a few days ago because the symptoms were not showing. Well, don't forget you can get in touch with me and some of the team on social media. I'm at Salim, S-A-L-Y-M. And that's all from the program. From me, Salim Kikeke, and the rest of the Focus on Africa team. Goodbye.